for you've been doing this now every day for five weeks, right? Exactly five weeks. Yep. Exactly. So you're noticing things to feel good about in my life. Muscles are stronger yep. now. And so my question to you is, have you noticed that when you look around your life in the present, there's more things to feel good about? Yes. At first, when I was doing this, um, and it was hard, but now I, when I'm walking around, if I say I see a pretty bird or something, I'll go, I'm grateful for seeing that pretty bird. Um, and I'm starting to notice that it's coming to me easier and it's happening throughout the day. Greg just signed up to my new mastermind course. Which yes. is yeah, which is that's great. Yeah, thanks. Well, so I mean it's like ninety percent probably the same as the Udemy course. But it's been updated, it's got better audio, it's got better videos, and there's a few new ideas in there. And it's a little crisper and a little shinier, you know. Wouldn't you Wouldn't you agree, Greg? Yeah, well, I think the other thing that happened too is that we were, and I forgot this, but I was listening to the video and I was looking for some, I think add some added some visualizations and new ideas, but um, also it's the idea of space repetition. I was listening to the same thing again a second or third time. Because I take it the UDB course that you had as well, but they were the same lessons. And I was, you know, I'm a new person from where I was when I was listening before. So I've changed. The issues in my life have changed. The goals and, you know, some of these goals I'm accelerating on. And so it was like a brand new message. I mean, and it was, I think it's that neuroplasticity, that space, you know, uh, reinforcement that, or space learning that uh, Paul Meyer is talking about that you, you teach is that it's totally different the third time or the fourth time. I mean, you got to listen to it probably six times to really get the message. Uh, I didn't take your Udemy course six times. and probably took it twice, I think, in my life. It's this was the third time around, and I'm like, I got more to learn. Absolutely. The- Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And so it's, in a way, it's very subtle, right? Because, you know, I mean, I feel like if you were to ask me, you know, I would say, well, I'm I'm the same person I was last year. But in actual fact, that's not true. And I know it's not true. If I think about it a little bit, you know, I realize I'm a different person now, right? <clears throat> and that's true for all of us. But the other part of it is that your brain is changing. And so your thoughts are changing, and the way you see yourself is changing, and the way you see the world is changing, you know. So that also is true, and I'm sure all of us would agree with that. And what that means in relation to what you just mentioned, Greg, and I've experienced this too many times, is that, you know, something appears different to you or it means something different to you or it strikes you differently depending on the mood you're in, right? I mean, if you're if you're angry, you know, if somebody in your life does something that hurts you, you know, and then they apologize, you might say, well, you know, who cares? Yeah, you're apologizing, but you don't mean it, right? So it will strike you differently, depending on the mood you're in. And so that's true for everything, basically, right? And so these videos, they're just jam-packed with all kinds of great ideas and insights. And so if you happen to watch the video one time and you go, okay, well, I understand that. You know, I get that, right? But if you happen to be in a different mood, a different frame of mind, and you watch the video again, it will strike you differently. It'll mean something different. So that's the value. That's the magic. This is what Paul Meyer called it. This is the magic of spaced repetition, right? This is part of the magic, is that it means something different every time. <clears throat> there's a great, um, there's a great quote that I heard from um, Bruce Lee, Li Xiaolong, right? Little Dragon Lee. That's what his name means in Chinese, Li Xiaolong. So he says, 
I don't fear a man that's practiced a thousand punches. I fear the man that's practiced one punch a thousand times. <laughs> Actually, I think he said 10,000 times, but, but it's true, right? I mean, you can imagine, you can imagine, and I've used this analogy before, somebody learning how to play golf, right? So, you know, they go to the pro and they're paying, you know, for the golf lesson and the pro says, okay, this time we're going to learn, you know, how to hit out of the sand, right? So he gives him a few tips and the guy, hit, you know, practices. He might hit, he might hit 50 balls out of the sand, right? <clears throat> and if he goes back the next time for the next lesson and the pro says, okay, well, we're going to work on the sand trap this week. And the guy says, well, wait a second. I already know that. I, you know, we did that last week, right? Wrong attitude, right? <clears throat> Wrong attitude. You know, the right attitude is I'm going to learn something every time I swing the club. And of course, that's true. You know, there's a great video that I recorded. I'll send it to you one of these days. It's an interview with um, Phil Mickelson, right? Who's arguably, you know, one of the top three, four, five golfers in the entire history of professional golf, right? And he's talking about hitting the ball. And he says, you know, if I move my thumb over a little bit, it takes two yards off. And if I move my finger this way, it adds another yard. And if I put my, you know, if I move my grip this way, it adds another three yards to it. And, you know, and like he goes through this whole litany of like different things and how it changes the, changes the flight of the ball, right? The ball goes a little higher, goes a little lower, curves a bit more to the right, curves a bit more to the left. It has more backspin, you know, or it stops or, you know, or it rolls ahead, you know. So this guy, I mean, he is an expert. He is an expert at hitting that little ball with a golf club, right? And so that's the only way to get better. He didn't learn that in a week, right? He's been, you know, he's been a professional golfer since he was a teenager. And even before that, he was an amateur golfer, right? So this thing that we're doing, which is we're learning how our thoughts create our life. And if you don't like the word create, then we're learning about how our thoughts influence our life. <clears throat> because there's, I, I don't think you can argue against the fact that your experience of your life is influenced by how you think. So, you know, studying it over and over and over again, and studying it every day, at least a little bit, to me, that's that's one of the absolutely best things that we can do. That's amazing. That's amazing when you tell me about it with Nick Nicholson. Um, yeah. So anybody have any... Uh, sorry? <laughs> Another thing that you're good at. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, doing things unconsciously, right? Yeah. Mm. So uh, this trip of mine is coming together, this trip of ours, you know, my wife and I, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's coming together and every day it gets a little more real, you know, um, planning and clarifying your goal, which, I mean, this is, you know, this is what I'm demonstrating here, right? And I'm demonstrating it, I mean, I'm doing it for me, of course, right? And, but I'm also doing it for you guys because I want to demonstrate, you know, what's the process here of choosing, a, just taking a dream, taking a, a, a concept and saying, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to experience this, right? And that to me is a, that's a goal. It's a decision that you make to experience one of your dreams. But amazing things are happening, you know, so like a lot of it is just mundane, deciding on where we're going to go and what we're going to do and when we're going to go there and, and that sort of thing. And um, so first of all, meeting this lady online, Sue Stone, she's the, she's the main person who is responsible for this, uh, for this speaking that I'm doing in Bournemouth to take place because she was the one that decided to, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll help you set up some talks, right? So that was a great, that was a great thing. And, um, and it happened, 
Well, I was making a recording about this this morning. I decided I'm go I, that I've started a new book. Um, and so I was, I was recording something this morning, which is going to be a part of the book, maybe the introduction or something in the beginning of the book, right? <clears throat> and um, so what I, was, what I was talking about was accident and design. Because life is a combination of accident and design. You know, number one, uh, you cannot be successful without a goal. Because success, by definition, it's the, it's the process of achieving a goal, right? So, oh, Naomi just said she'll be right back. Um, so, yeah, so success is the, is the process of step-by-step -step achieving a goal. And as long as you're in the process, you're successful. And if you stop the process, then you're not successful anymore. <clears throat> so, but luck, accident, is just one of those things that happen, right? That we can't necessarily, you know, we can't necessarily control them. I mean, we can put ourselves in a situation where we're more likely to have a happy accident happening. So, for example, when I first had that idea of going to England, and then I thought, hey, wouldn't it be good to do some speaking there? So, then I thought, okay, well, I contacted my future self, who's speaking in England, and I said, how did I get here? How did I do this? You know, and so the, you know, the message I got, or the intuition I got, or the idea that I got was, well, write to some likely people who might be able to invite you to talk. The same as I just mentioned to Phil, you know, hey, if you want me to talk at your church, uh, just let me know. So I did the same thing to these people. You know, I just made a list of kind of, you know, positive growth centers in England. And I wrote to them and said, hi, this is me. Here's my biography. Here's a link to the book that I wrote. <clears throat> my, you know, my book, Mind, Time and Power. Uh, if you'd like me to talk to your uh, to your group, I'd be happy to do it. Just let me know. I'm I'm going to be in England, you know, during these dates, right? Well, most of those people never wrote back, and a few of them wrote back and said, "Oh, well, we don't have anything to offer you here. You know, either I don't have any group, or we don't have a group that has speakers. You know, whatever, right?" But one person wrote back and said, "Oh, you should contact Sue Stone." Well, I had never heard of Sue Stone, so I looked her up and I contacted her and and we set up uh, a Zoom call and we were on the Zoom call and she said, I looked at your book, I got a copy of your book and I was looking through it, I think it's fantastic, I'd love to have you come and talk to us when you're in England, right? So that's a perfect example, I think, of accident and design, right? I had no idea that who, who she was. I had never heard of her. I had no idea that she was going to say yes, right? Uh, but she did. So that was a result of my reaching out to these people and saying, okay, here's an idea. I'll just put this out there, right? I wrote to about 25 or 30 different organizations, I think. And, you know, so here we go, right? So, so that is, um, here comes Naomi back. So, so that's, that's a combination of accident and design, right? <clears throat> now, people misunderstand this. The vast majority of people, I would estimate 98% of the population, maybe 95%, maybe 90%, I don't know, but certainly, you know, somewhere in that range. They think either you're successful because you're lucky, and so... That's a mistake because, number one, if you're lucky, you're not successful. Like, I consider the invitation from Sue Stone, that's a lucky break, right? Now, of course, I, um, I set it up in a way, or at least I, I created the possibility of it by writing to these people and then following up when that person said to me, contact Sue Stone, right? I did. So I certainly laid the groundwork to have a happy, happy um, coincidence, or you might say um, a happy accident, right? 
the same as, you know, you go to the racetrack and you just idly buy a ticket on a horse race. Well, if the horse comes in and you win, hey, that's, you know, that's an accident. But it's a combination of you buying the ticket and, and having the horse come in, right? <clears throat> so it's a, it's a combination of accident and design. Well, most people completely misunderstand this. They think that people that are successful are successful because they're lucky. Well, that's not true, you know. Um, the reason Phil Mickelson wins golf contests is a combination of luck and design. You know, he spent 40 years, 50 years, well, now he's 51 or something, so he's probably been, been dreaming about being a champion golfer for you know, ever since he was three or four or five years old. So he's put 40 years at least, or 45 years of effort into it. But he'll, he'll admit, if you ask him, he'll admit, <clears throat> he wins a contest, he'll say, I was lucky, you know? Because, you remember on the 16th, I hit that tree and it bounced onto the green? It could have easily bounced in the water, right? So that was luck, you know? So everything is a combination of, of accident and design. And so people misunderstand that. And the other thing that they misunderstand is what success is and how to engage the success process, which is what we're doing with this workbook. You know, the success process is figuring out what your dreams are, choosing one, putting together a plan, systematically working on it step by step by step, and then eventually arriving at your, at your goal, right? And so that's the success process, which is largely what we've been talking about for the last year. And of course, you know, Phil Mickelson's goal, I find this very interesting. His goal from the time he was a little kid was to win the U.S. Open. Well, he's won everything else. <laughs> he's never won the U.S. Open. He's still trying. He tried again last year. As a matter of fact, he's probably going to try again this year. <clears throat> and who knows, he might win it. But So he never achieved his goal, right? So what does that mean? Well, to me, what it means is, you know, nothing's guaranteed, right? <laughs> I so mean, he did he's, win the Masters, didn't he? He won the Masters. He's won, he's won the other three majors. <laughs> plus, you know, he's won, he's won more, more money in golf and more tournaments than most other people, right? There's only a few people that have won more, more tournaments than he has. So he's won pretty well everything else, but he's never won the U.S. Open. So he's come close a couple times. He came, he came second, I think, five times. <laughs> so he said, I count that as a win. <clears throat> but it's not really a win because he didn't win it. But, um, but the point is, you know, that as a byproduct of trying to win the U.S. Open, he won the Masters and the British Open, and, you know, he won um, the PGA Championship and he's won all kinds of other tournaments and millions and millions of dollars and raised a fantastic family and, and has a foundation that he helps a lot, lots of people, you know. So, and people say this all the time, right? It's not so much achieving the goal. It's the person you become in the process of going for the goal. <laughs> That's a sad story. Close, but no cigar. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And I'm sure if you rub it in, he would feel bad about that. But, you know, he's philosophical, right? He's philosophical. Um, mm -hmm. Because, Tell me about it. you know, he's, he's, he's lived a great life. I mean, the truth is, I, I assume, you know, the truth is, he would never have won anything if his goal hadn't been to become a person who can win the U.S. Open, right? And the truth is, he still is a person who can win the U.S. Open. I mean, he's, you know, he could win it this year. It's possible. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, any, um, any comments on that? Any feedback? <clears throat> well, it's um, one of the things you were talking a little bit about success and about pursuing, um, pursuing success and staying on the path. I mean, Nicholson, is it Nicholson with an M? Nicholson, it's with an no, M, No, it's right? Nicholson with an M, yeah. Yep. And so um, <clears throat> he's an example of somebody that's going after a goal that other people have gone after. Now, he succeeded beyond them, it sounds like, in a lot of sports stars. I mean, to, to win in an athletic competition at the highest level is 
probably a pretty exciting life and one worth going for. But, you know, from from my level, it's um, not real applicable other than that he's a winner and we're, 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 we're studying winning, right? Um, you know, when I, in my life, there's different things that happen that are totally unique to me that other people are not doing and your, as the trip is to you. Um, and I think that's, it's kind of interesting to see, it's really an example to me of volition, of manifestation, you know, that you've created this idea, I'll take a trip and I'll do some coaching while I'm there, teaching while I'm there is kind of a new vector. It's almost like it's the head of the ship captain. It's like the ship, the ship captain seeking the shore. You know, you had all these boats going around the ocean with these different captains, which is like a lot of us living our life and saying, I want to go here. And I think in your book, you talked about waypoints. You might be going from A to B to C to D. And that lesson you were saying, that's not where you end up. You end up at A1, B1, C1, D1, which is you got off a of course from A, became A1. And B1 is different. And so maybe if you're not where A is supposed to be and you're going to B, you're at A1, going to B1, you might end up with having to speed up or change the tack or whatever it is. Um, you have to adjust to that change. But ultimately, the shore is your goal, which is in your mind. It's really created in your mind. Um, and I think that that was what was striking me a little bit when you're talking, is that you know the first thing is you come up with this creative idea. I will think I'll go to England. And they think, yeah, well, I'm there. Might as well you know, meet some people over there that are cross-continent, that are doing the same thing we're doing or maybe interested in what we're doing. I haven't even thought of what you're doing. But then you've got this lady reading your book, Sue, and she likes the concept just like we all did as we read it at some point. We're like, hey, that's a good idea. Why not think about the future and time and Einstein and all this stuff and try to approach it a little different than the Newtonian way? Because a lot of the goal setting is not working. That's why we're here is that a lot of the traditional ways of just saying, I'll set a goal and do 20% different. And, you know, the next three years I'll grow 20%. And I didn't even have what I wanted to begin with. Um, right. And so to do a little bit more than what I wanted. Doesn't mean, isn't real compelling. Where I think when you've looked at it differently and said, well, maybe I'll be a different person. You know, maybe I'll, you know, uh, be totally different trajectory for my life or forget all the garbage I'm carrying with me and just pretend it didn't happen. You know, or something like that, and instead just start. Maybe I came from a rich family instead of a poor one. You know, you can manipulate that past. You can look at a different future and create it. So to me, it's a more meaningful one. Is that you created it? It's an example. I mean, he did the same thing, but he may have grew up. He said at six, he saw, "I'm going to have that title. I'm going to be the world champion golfer." Um, well, what if you want to be something like a little different, a d different combination? Maybe you've got a hobby of airplane flying, like uh, Meyer had. He made up model airplanes. And he became an airplane pilot uh, in addition to being a millionaire. You know, so he started, to, and his dad taught him to create things. And his dad was a, uh, a carpenter. And so he said, this is how you create a, a shelf system, a shelf system for a house or a table. You think of it first. You, you do it. He taught him how to learn. But um, that's the interesting thing to me is being the ship captain. We're all doing that. Um, and we're inspiring each other. Like, you know, Kathy has her story about doing better and Naomi and everybody is kind of changing their life, which to me, that's a, I'm a different person last year because this group was not here last year. You know, so I'm like, oh, it's working for them and it's working for them and it's working for them. And we're sharing hacks or hints along the way. Hey, if you... You know, if you use an Excel sheet, I have the option to use an Excel sheet because Kathy uses an Excel sheet. You know, I have the option of doing some of the things that Naomi was doing and because of that, so our meditating. You know, so I, I think it's changing as we're moving along. It's like ship captains all calling each other and say, hey, the fish are over here or, or uh, you know, there's you, you might want to fish over here. You might want to use this on your boat. Um, so I, I think it's exciting. Yeah, but don't forget. I mean, that's good. <clears throat> that's great. But don't forget that for every ship captain, there's a thousand passengers. Well, that's true. And yeah. lots of them don't even know why they're there or what they're doing there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> hey, where's this ship going? How did I end up on this boat? I didn't want to be on this ship, you know. So, yeah, I mean, the sea captains, they're a rare group of people. That You know, the, you know, the, the sea captains are the, are, the, are the top one or two or three percent. That's... Well, that's how I, you know, that's how I see it. 
the real creative ones are ones that are going where no one's gone before. I call it like the Star Trek thing. I mean, but uh, Elon Musk is creating things with Starlink and uh, you know the tunneling, the boring company, and all these things that he is going where no one even imagined that it would be there. So yeah, he's but there's pretty... only one Elon Musk. Don't forget, you know, and um, and there's only one Greg Andera too. And there's one Phil Watson and one Kathy Hebert and one Naomi Barrett and one Anthony Hamilton. And we forget this, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is always, you know, where am I and where do I want to go now? That's, yeah. that's so the basic. That's... Can, I think a lot, of, a lot of my life I was doing some things, but a lot of there's a lot of bobbing around, too. Um, Tell me about it. You know, it. when you find out you can get going. You get going in a direction, you're like, hey, this actually works. I mean, I had some success because I had goal planning. I mean, I had studied goal planning for years. I mean, from, you know, went to college, university, and things like that, or high school. And there's people that teach you how to kind of do something. But uh, it is different when you really start to realize you can have a lot of control. Well, I don't recall ever in all the schooling that I took. I don't recall anybody ever telling me how to be successful, how to set a goal, how to achieve a goal. Nobody, except Paul Meyer. I mean, he was he was the first one. And there are certain places you can go. Like if you want to become an architect, you know, you can go to university for six years or so, and you can study under a master for X number of years, and you can learn how to design a building. But the average person never learns that stuff, never learns that process, right? And, and yet we're all designing our future, but we're doing it unconsciously. And this, this was, the, you know, this was the, uh, the theme of this thing that I was working on this morning. It's like, you know, if you wanted a house... And you scraped all your money together for a down payment and you went to the bank and you got a loan. And then you, you know, you talk to a builder about building your home. And the builder says, okay, well, it'll be ready. You know, it'll take about a year for us to get this whole thing together. And I'll give you a call when it's, when it's done, right? So, <clears throat> so you're sitting at home and the phone rings one day and the builder says, okay, your home is ready. Come on, you know. You go there, and you go, wait a second, How? Wh why did you decide to put this ugly, stupid-looking carpet in here? And the guy might say, well, <laughs> you know, nobody told us, right? We had some extra carpet lying around, and nobody said anything, so we put it in. And then you go to the bathroom, and you say, hey, wait a second, that, I don't like that shower stall. And look at that toilet. I, 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 I hate that design. And the sink is too high. You know, who, who told you to do it like this? Well, nobody told us. You know, we just used our best judgment. Well, nobody would do that, right? I mean, that would be stupid to do that. And yet that's exactly what we're doing with our life. You know, our life is being created and, you know, it's, it's happening all by itself. I mean, one year from now, assuming that you're still alive, you're going to come back, you know, and you're going to wake up, whatever day it is today, the 18th of March, you know. You're going to wake up and you're going to be a year older. And if your life is not any better, it's because you haven't decided to make it any better. As a matter of fact, it may be worse, right? So this sort of fundamental attitude that, hey, you know, I'm involved in creating my life at some level here, you know. At the moment, it's, it's, it's totally unconscious, and I'm learning now to be more conscious of it. Then, you know, over time, you, be, you, know, you become more conscious, you become more able, and you get to the point, like Phil Mickelson is with holding a golf club, where he's learned, after hitting literally millions of golf balls, he's learned that, hey, if I move my finger here, the ball flies l lower. If I move my thumb this way, it spins backwards, you know. Um, <clears throat> so he learned that because he hit 5 million golf balls. Well, we have 50,000 thoughts a day. Well, we have a million thoughts in 20 days, right? Approximately, I mean, you know, roughly, right? <clears throat> so we've had millions of thoughts over the course, billions of thoughts over the course of our life. 
And so all we have to do, at least to get started, is to say, hey, you know, I have a little, I have a little choice here. I can choose to, if I want to improve my health, if I want to improve my relationships, if I want to improve my income, if I want to improve the place I'm living, what is it now? And how would I like it to be different, right? And make, a, you know, make some choices. So, but a lot of people never realize that, right? Like a lot of people never get to the place where they realize, hey, I can actually change my life here if I put a little thought into it. Which I well, think, which I think is a real tragedy. You know, that like nobody taught us this in school. Nobody ever mentioned to us, you know, uh, we're, 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 we're taught either on purpose or we're taught by accident. Just float along, you know, stay on the ship that you're on, do what you're told, you know, and follow along with everybody else and and your life will unfold. Well, your life's going to unfold, but you're going to find yourself at some point and say, hey, wait a second, how did I end up here? Well, the captain took the ship here. Oh, well, I didn't know this is where we were going. <laughs> you know, it's like, what? <laughs> So to me, that's the difference, right? Is like realizing that hey, I, I, I have, I have some input here. I can, you know, uh, it, it, if I can't become the captain, maybe I can be the first mate, or I, can, you know, something, right? Well, I mean, a couple of things in that process too is that there are some techniques that are being used in going after those goals. I mean, there's focus. There is um, concentration. I think on doing that, and there's practice. You know, Phil, you're talking about Phil, um, you know, knowing these techniques of you put your thumb forward a little bit, your thumb back to to be able to get progress towards this goal. He knows how to go from waypoints literally on the golf course uh, by different techniques, right? He's practiced all those skills. 500 and golf it, balls a day. Yeah, we have to do the same thing in our life. Exactly. You're moving towards exactly. your work on yep. the exactly. strategy. You have to look at your strengths as well. Look at your weaknesses. So, well, he's not a very good driver. So, you better keep the ball down the middle of the fairway because he, you know, cannot make up for it with long, long drives. Or, um, I think you have to know yourself and be able to figure out what you can do better. I mean, so those are some of the things that go into the the nuance to be able to make some progress. I, mean, I think one of the things that you know, we talk about life balance. Maybe in certain areas of life, you can't be balanced because you're not going to make any movement. You can't do everything well. Um, you know, do a couple techniques well to move towards the goal. Um, to achieve your strategy. You know, and I think to have success. And once you get to success, they start to build on each other. That's why I think we were, I was listening to your session for last week because it wasn't here. But you guys were talking about the toothpaste and talking about, um, uh, you yeah, know, that was your big breakthrough, the, right? Buying a buying a tube of toothpaste. toothpaste. You, you know, I said, well, if he, can, if he can do his shoes, if he can shine his shoes, I can get toothpaste. I think I can get my dog out of the room here. But uh, Kathy was talking about the, uh, you know cleaning your house. Exactly. Um, you know, and that's the and that's the key, right? Like in my book, uh, Mind, Time, and Power, I talk about you know the first half of the book is about discovering your inner power, and that's what it is. It's realizing, hey, right now I have this thought in my mind, and if I don't like it, I can change it to a different thought. That's the that's the power you have. You have the power to change a thought, right? And it takes a long time to even realize that that's what your power is. And then once you figure that out, then you then you realize, well, which thought am I going to change? You know, for a long time you don't know which thought you're going to change, right? Um, I was going to mention, speaking of Kathy. Um, I have a comment about something you said last week. Um, are you still? Yeah, you're still there, right? right? Yeah, um, still here. Yeah. So this was. I thought this was interesting. You know, you were talking about um, you enjoy learning things and taking courses and that kind of thing, right? And so one of your one of your goals, uh, you know, one of your intentions, you were talking about was. Um, to do a half an hour of learning every day. Yeah. And 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 you said and this is I'm just reminding you of this because you probably forgot <laughs> it, right? But if you watch the video, you'll you'll see it. You said that you decided to do a half an hour of learning every day. But what happened was that didn't work out because it, you weren't always able to do a half an hour of learning every day. 
So if you missed your half an hour of learning, if you only did 10 minutes, you felt bad. Yeah, I felt like I failed. You felt like you failed, right? Yeah. So then what happened was you changed the definition. And you yes. said, even if I just do a couple of minutes, I'm a winner, right? Exactly. Now that <laughs> is a really profound piece of insight to realize that, you know, and I talked about that uh, several times already. You know, one of them was in terms of um, in terms of quitting smoking, right? Like I decided, and I didn't even realize it was conscious. I mean, it was just a thought in my head, you know. And I thought, if I could quit smoking for a year, then I'll I'll be successful. I'll have it beat, you know. Well, it took me a few months to realize. Hey, wait a second. That's a stupid way to define success because. I'm not going to feel successful until the whole year is gone. I have to be a non-smoker for a whole year in order for it to feel good. So then I changed the definition. I changed the definition to one minute, right? <laughs> if I can quit smoking for one minute, I'm a success. <clears throat> and e even though initially I thought that was a stupid idea, it turned out to be really profound. So, and you discover the same thing, right? If as long as I'm learning something for one or two minutes, then I feel successful. So we And it's working. It's working, absolutely, because that's yes. the thing, right? What you want to do is you want to feel successful. You want to set your life up so that you're when you're working on, on something that interests you, you feel good, right? You feel successful, mm -hmm. you feel powerful, right? And that's how you do it, is you do it by defining success for you. Right. Rather yeah. than what somebody else says, you know, somebody else says, well, you have to do a half an hour or, or, or it doesn't count. So you do 20 minutes and you feel like, oh, I blew it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so now you and do I always it. felt like I had to make up the time. Like if, if yes. I went three days without studying and I would be like, okay, on the fourth day, now I have to study for two hours to exactly. make up for the half hours that I missed. So you so, make your life a living hell, yeah. right? By, yes. by setting some kind of a goal unconsciously because somebody said it and you adopted it, you know. And uh, so, so we've talked about this uh, numerous times here on the, you know, during these calls. And um, I'll remind you of, of one that uh, Jessica and I talked about, you know, where she wanted to move and she found out she couldn't move. That something was blocking her from moving. She kept telling herself, well, it's not a good time. I'm not ready yet. It's not a good thing. You know, it's, I want to move, but I can't. I don't know why, you know. And then after we talked about it a little bit, we realized that, ah, she made a decision when her child, when her son was really young, that I have to stay close to him. Otherwise, I'm not a good mom. If I move away, he, you know, he's going to miss his mom, right? So she decided, I have to stay close to my son. Well, now her son's 25 or more. But that thought was still in her head, you know, and that was blocking her from moving. She said, you know, I can't move and I don't know why. I feel like it isn't a good thing. It, it, it isn't a good idea for me to move. Well, it was that thought that said, you have to stay close to your son. Well, when she became conscious of that, the same as when you became conscious of saying, I have to learn for at least a half an hour or, or it doesn't count you know as soon as she became conscious of it she said oh well i don't need to stay close to him anymore he's you know he's a grown man now he's an adult right so almost immediately she moved she found another place to live so it's those unconscious thoughts you know those little decisions that we make which we have forgotten about and in my experience the only way that we uncover those is by a little bit of visualization, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of working in the workbook, examining our thoughts, reviewing our thoughts, writing them down, you know, and thinking about them. And then we think, well, wait a second, you know, I have this attitude here. It's, it's not working for me anymore. Now, her attitude about staying close to her son, I mean, that was a good, I, that was a good idea, right? That was a good belief, a good attitude to have. But now it's outgrown its usefulness, right? I'll, I'll share something really quickly about when I was thinking of moving out of the Lower Mainland. And it took me like seven years to finally do it. But when I was talking to my son about it, I said, oh, I need to stay here for my granddaughter. And he's like, don't stay because of us. We wouldn't stay for you. 
And at first I was taken aback and he goes, I don't mean that in a mean way. I'm just saying if our lives took us in a direction where we were moving away, we wouldn't stay just because of you and you shouldn't do the same just because of us. You need to live your life the way you want to live your life. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely yeah. right. You know, being, you know, that's the virtue of selfishness, they call it, right? Doing something for you, you know. I mean, I, I did the same thing. I came to the same realization uh, when I decided to go to England, right? I mean, when I, when I had the idea to go to England and bring my wife to England or go, you know, together to England, uh, almost immediately I had this thought, well, I hope this makes her feel good. I hope this makes her happy, you know, because I've been promising one of these days I'll take you to Europe, you know. And... So it took me a couple days to think about that, and then I realized, hey, wait a second. What if she's not happy? I'm going to be upset, right? <laughs> what if she doesn't appreciate it? I'm going to say, well, you should appreciate it because, you know, blah, 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 right? I thought that's a stupid attitude. So I'm not going to do it to make her happy. I'm going to do it for me. <laughs> well, I'm sure she's going to be happy. I mean, she's happy already, you know, but... It was the same thing, right? I said, oh, you know, I'm going to do this for her, you know, to make her happy. Well, that was not a good reason. I mean, of course, I expect her to be happy and I'm, you know, I'm pleased that she's happy. But yeah, you know, we have to do things for our own reasons, right? Do you, do you think it just, it makes us feel better telling ourselves that we're doing things for other people instead of just ourselves? Is well, I think, I mean, my... That? Yeah, my my answer would be because we're told it's better to give than receive. Mm -hmm. John Kehoe says, no, that's wrong. It's better to give and receive. In other words, give mm -hmm. to yourself too, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, of course we do things. I mean, we, you know, we, we like to see our loved ones happy, right? We like to see our kids happy and, and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. You know, the old... The old thing about, you know, I'm doing this for your own good, right? Well, the kid might say, wait a second, <laughs> I don't want you to do this, you know. I don't want to eat these, I don't want to eat these turnips. I mean, that was my thing when I was young, you know. My mother making turnips, which I hated, and she said, you know, you have to finish all your food on your plate or else, you know, you got to stay at the table, right? Um, I didn't care about the turnips except for the fact that I hated the taste of them. I like turnips now, though, <laughs> but not very, but not very much. You know, they're they're not they're not one of my favorite things. Um, <clears throat> so here's here's another idea that I had this week. Uh, any, anybody want to say anything about what we just talked about? Uh, so here's. Here's the here's the insight that I had this week, and I mean it's not a new idea. We've talked about it quite a bit, but it was just kind of a different way of looking at it, right? Um, one of the big breakthroughs that I had years ago, and I talked about this one time when I was on. Uh, I think it might have been coast to coast. I'm not sure, but I was on some podcast, and and somebody asked me a question, and I answered them, and and so. Somebody wrote to me and said, wow, you know, I bought your book and I love it. And the reason I bought the book was because of your answer to this question, right? Or, or at least this idea, you know. And um, here it is. That if you want to feel happy, think of something that makes you feel happy. Now that's profound because you can feel happy anytime you want. You have a past successes list. All you have to do is look at it and you, and you, and you feel better, right? But think of what we're taught. Think of what we're taught, you know. I feel the way I feel because of what's happened in my life. If we believe that, then the next thought is, well, if I want to feel better, I need to do something to make myself feel better. I got to meet this person. I got to find somebody to love me. I got to get a raise at work. You know, whatever it might be, right? Ice cream. Exactly. 
Exactly. Or I got to <laughs> stick a needle in my arm. That's, you know, that uh, that's what a lot of people do, right? So this is what I mean when I say most people don't know how to feel good. Their whole lives, they're chasing how to feel good. And they don't realize that all they have to do is remember something that makes them feel good and they, and they feel good. They think that they have to change the world. I got to get a new girlfriend. I got to get a new boyfriend. I got to get a better job. I got to move for, to a different location, to, you know, in, in order to feel better. Well, what they're going to find if they if they keep that attitude is they're going to find a new girlfriend. Guess what? Same as the last girlfriend. Right? <laughs> find a new boyfriend. Same as the last boyfriend. You know, find a new apartment. Same as the last apartment. Right. Um. So yeah. So uh, so Anthony, yeah. Anthony, this kind of reminds me of uh, you know some conversations I've heard about child development and uh, you know small children and uh, you know that one of the you know for kids that are cranky and and whatnot um, you know one of the pieces of advice to parents is to you know somehow to to teach the uh, child how to self self uh, soothe. You know, which is sort of like, I mean, that is uh, sort of the beginning of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, make yourself feel good, right? Because, of course, that's what we all want. We all want to feel good, and we, and we, and we don't want to feel bad. Um, so, the, um, so the insight that I got this week about that, <clears throat> this idea that, you know, if you remember something that makes you feel good, then you're going to feel good, right? Well, you combine that, so that's mental time travel. I mean, that's that's one way to think about your mind being a time machine, is that you can get positive energy from the past by thinking of a past success, right? So when you combine that with neuroplasticity, what it means is the more you do that, the more often you're going to feel good. And that's going to change your thinking, change your brain. And pretty soon, feeling good is going to be something that you can do more easily and more habitually, right? So when your brain changes and when your nerves change, when you start to feel good and you know how to feel better by using your thinking, the magic thing that happens is when you look at the world, you look at the physical world, you're going to see more things that make you feel good. Because now those feeling good nerves have been exercised and strengthened. So this, to me, this is profound. It's like I can exercise my feeling good muscles, if I use that term. And when I do that, then I notice more things to feel good about in the world right now. Now that is powerful. That's, that's powerful. And so I have a question for Kathy along these lines. Right. So you've been doing this month, uh, this daily gratitude process, right? Yes. So gratitude is something that we feel when we notice something that is positive in our life. Yes. So according to what I just said, you're, you've been doing this now every day for five weeks, right? Exactly five weeks, yep. Exactly. So you're noticing things to feel good about in my life. Muscles are stronger yep. now. And so my question to you is, have you noticed that when you look around your life in the present, there's more things to feel good about? Yes. At first, when I was doing this, I had to, because I'm I do three a day, I had to really sit there and think, what am I grateful for? What am I grateful for? I can't say this cup of coffee every day. <laughs> right? um, and it was hard. But now I, when I'm walking around, if I say I see a pretty bird or something, I'll go, I'm grateful for seeing that pretty bird. Um, and I'm starting to notice that it's coming to me easier and it's happening throughout the day.
Okay, now I want you to pay attention to what Kathy just said. Rewind this video for about a minute and listen to what Kathy says. She said that by doing a simple little exercise a few minutes a day, she has changed the way she feels about the things in her life. So, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Now, this is profound. I hope people are paying attention here because this is really profound. What it means is that Kathy has been doing something to exercise her mind for the last five weeks. And the net result is that when she's walking around in the, in the, in the present, she notices more things that make her feel good. Yeah. Now, that's what everybody wants right? And how, how easy is it? Three minutes a day working in your gratitude journal or whatever, right? Yeah, so that's, it's like uh, less yeah. than five minutes. Exactly, yeah. five minutes, you know, five minutes. A, so if you, you know, if you were to advertise to somebody, hey, you know, I have a technique here, five minutes a day will change your life. People would say, ah, you know, you're crazy, right? doesn't work. I tried it. I had a gratitude journal once. I wrote in it for three days and uh, nothing changed. <laughs> you know, that's what... That's the thing. That's I, what people I do. usually do that too. I'll try it for a month and I'll be like, oh, this isn't helping. It's just stupid. Exactly. But this time I was determined that I was just going to keep doing it for a year. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, look out for the next year, man. You're going to be floating it, <laughs> yeah. you know, by a, a year from now, you're going to be like, whoa, you know. But yeah. yeah, so that's great. So that, I mean, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the smartest things you can do is to, I mean, in, you know, I mean, the way I look at it, right, with, you know, the mental time travel and the neuroplasticity sort of aspect of it is you're doing something every day for a few minutes that's exercising a certain neural connection, a certain network of nerves in your in your brain and in your body you're probably yeah. you know i'm sure if we were to wire you up you know and and take a blood t a blood test uh, i have no doubt that scientists would be able to measure changes in your brain and changes in the neurochemicals in your in your body because of this exercise you're doing you know this gratitude thing i also want to say something about the past successes list which has been like <clears throat> really important in in this change that's happening with me because at first I was like I haven't done anything in my life I'm almost 60 and I haven't really done anything but when I started making the list you know maybe I came up with five things oh yeah I, blah blah and and then I was like when you told the story about the yo-yo contest then I was like those those that's what he means by past successes, stuff like that. And then I was like, okay, I can come up with a few more things. And the list just kept getting longer and longer. And um, then I was like, oh, actually, I have been kind of successful in my life. And I've, I've done a lot of things. And then even, you know, when someone asked me for a special kind of query at work or a special kind of report and they say I know this is going to be a reach Kathy but do you think you could and then I'm like yeah I've done this kind of thing before it's on my past successes list so I know I can do it and I will do it and then I will add that to my past successes list and I'm also in this it's a shorter group but it's a it's called a it's about our stories and changing our stories it, there's a lot of parallels with this group and so I told them in the group about, they talked about keeping in mind things they've been successful at in the past. And I said, make a list. That's what I've been doing and keep it and look at it often. And they're like, that's a great idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm spreading the message. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they never thought of it, yeah. right? They never thought. I mean, all of you guys, if you're interested and ladies, you know, Naomi and Kathy, um, <clears throat> you could start this as a business. You could start right now and say, look, I'm going to do a seminar in how to change your life, how to feel good anytime you want. And I'm going to do a talk at, you know, such and such a place. And it's uh, $3 to get in. Well, people are going to come, right? 
And the talk is, here's your past successes list. Everybody write down three past successes or five past successes. And you could give a little talk for 15, 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour or more about how to use the past successes list. And everybody would love it, right? And you'd have another source of income. Now, I'm talking from experience here. I've been doing this for over 40 years, right? I have a technique that will make you feel better about your life. Are you interested? Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. But the problem is, as you just pointed out, Kathy, you know, people misunderstand what I'm talking about, right? Like you said, you know, oh, that's what he means by past success. Oh, I thought he meant something else, right? No, that's it. Yeah, I found it. That's it. Well, you know. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's funny that, you know, these techniques, you, you think you call that fuel in your book. You said this is the fuel or, or one of the, your trainings. Well, the energy Passive. is the fuel. I mean, the feeling good is the fuel. Right. But uh, here's, here's what I sent to my wife today. She's on a trip and it says, uh, here's a little bird by the pool. Right. And I said, I hope you have a nice day. But it's so weird that you would talk about a little bird, Kathy, today, because I, yeah, I've had, you know, last time I sent my wife a picture, bird was probably 10 years ago or something. But uh, <laughs> you know, I was noticing this little bird, sweet little thing by the pool, and it just looks so innocent and cute. And uh, so I noticed it. But you know, I think that you're, the way you're changing your view with these techniques, you know, changes um, your energy. Because that's where I was like, where does the motivation come from? It was one of the challenges I was having, you know, to go after these goals, because once you bob around for a while, you know, you start to get discouraged. I think people get discouraged and, you know, to see some success. I mean, we, we maybe have little successes, uh, probably because somebody we bumped into and they had a hobby or something and we did it. Or so we had a couple techniques that we put together, but to put together sustain, sustainable group of techniques that regularly get progress is the challenge. And so they become like different clubs that we have. But the gratitude list is one, for example. The other one is to change your, I think this was earlier, it was kind of like paint the chair red, right? I think you're talking a little bit as a technique. You say, hey, I'm going to take this thing and overlay it on my feelings to change the feeling. Yeah. And to get some, I mean, but there are several different techniques that we've kind of been exploring here. But as you listen to them more often, and I think you have to listen to it many times to get one of them, but they become a kind of a repertoire of items that you can choose from. I mean, I was so inspired by listening to Kathy talking about how she's changing her life last week. Uh, you know, that it's, it's starting to accelerate. I'm like, well, that points out what I'm doing right. So, you know, they kind of feed off of each other a little bit. And you start to say, wait, this is a body of techniques that makes you feel different about your life, um, which is, you know, very hopeful. That's what everybody wants, right? Everybody wants to feel better about their life and themselves. And this is yeah. it. This is this is what we're talking about, right? And it's subtle, right? I mean, it says somewhere in the Bible, maybe Phil, who's more of a Bible expert than I am, might know where it's from. But there's some statement in the Bible that says, you know, the kingdom of God is spread upon the earth, but people don't see it. It's like Kathy could say, well, you know, there's all kinds of things in my life that make me feel grateful. I just didn't see them before. That's, that's yeah. it. And I, you know, I learned that by shining my shoes. Kathy learned it by dusting her table, you know, <laughs> the last week or last month, right? Phil learned it well, by going to the store and buying a tube of toothpaste. I mean, Hollywood's been talking about the multiverse here, which is kind of an application of this. They're saying there's, there's a, there's a, I don't know if I believe totally in the way they're presenting it, but they're saying there's an alternate reality that's available to you. You know, if you shine your shoes, your life takes a different track than if you don't shine your shoes. So there's the life where Anthony never shined his shoes, and it would look like this. It would be Loserville, from what you were saying in terms of your life. But you said, hey, I can, you know, I don't need any money to shine my shoes. And so you were able to change your, your thing. You said, okay, the shoes are shining. Now you said, okay, well, maybe I'll clean the room. So I'll clean the room, and they say, maybe I will go back to school. But then you start saying, you know, all these things, all of a sudden your life starts to have different possibilities. And I think that was one of the neat things that was talking about forward-looking in your life or future self, 
one of the other techniques that's similar to what you're talking about painting the chair red was to go back and relook at our past life and say, maybe I interpreted that wrong. Maybe so-and-so wasn't so mean. Maybe they came from a tough upbringing, so they weren't as nice as they should have been. So maybe I shouldn't harbor a grudge against that person from years ago. Forgive them, understand where he came out with empathy. And, and now I feel different about my day today. I'm not so jaded, you know, going forward. But one of the other things that started to happen that was another technique that I've started to use of late which is one is a shoot off of what you've done, Anthony, it's a new creation, was, well, what if I had a different past? In other words, if you're going to go sell, I've seen guys go in sales, I'm in sales, like Phil is, when you're selling and you come from a wealthy family, you sell differently than a guy who comes from a poor family. And you say, well, why would they sell different? One's much more timid. I've seen guys that come from, you know, places where they had airplanes and jets and mansions, and they walk in the room very confidently. They walk in and say, you know, hey, I'm here. We're going to buy, you know, you're not buying $100,000 worth of product. You're buying half a million. And I say, oh, my gosh, half a million. Who's going to spend half a million dollars? So, well, this is nothing. It's chump change. Right. Like, it turns it says, Greg, I own airplanes in my family. We own golf courses. I say, wait a minute. So now if I look back and say, wait a minute, what if I own golf courses in an alternate past? It's not real. But if you go into that view as if you did, you walk more confidently into that room. You say, hey, we're buying golf courses today. We're yeah. buying airplanes. Yeah, that's right. You know, you won't ask for a bigger sale because you're a different person. And right. so that's like pretending you didn't have all the woes me in the background. So it's an interesting technique. You know, you can suspend your disbelief for five minutes to do it. It's not gonna end your, you know, it's not gonna be delusional for five minutes in a way that makes you more confident. Exactly. It's certainly an interesting technique. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to delude yourself, right? For five minutes. Um, so a couple things you said there I would comment on. Number one, multiverse is, the multiverse is real. We change universes 50,000 times a day. Every thought is a doorway to a new universe. So I can leave you there and we can think about that for the next week. Uh, but I won't leave you there. But think about that one, you know. By the way, speaking of the multiverse, has anybody seen that new movie that just won all the Academy Awards, uh, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once? No, it was last night. Did you see it? Half of it. It's a crazy movie. <laughs> I wanted to watch it, but um, I don't know. It didn't capture me. <laughs> well, I had to watch it like in two or three different pieces because after about 10 minutes, I had enough, you know. Um, but then I well, watched I, it. Somebody, I, uh, somebody uh, at our church uh, went to it, and uh, and halfway through they walked out. Exactly. Well, I did the same thing. You know, I wa like I watched a few minutes, and I turned it off, and I watched another ten minutes. I turned it. But after I got about halfway through, then it was like, oh wow, this is actually quite amazing. And now, when I think about it, you know, I think it's just the most amazing piece of work. That these two guys, these two writers and directors that put it together, uh, it's just the most amazing thing, you know. And I was talking, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I said, "Hey, have you seen this movie, <laughs> Everything Everywhere All at Once?" And the person said, "Oh, I yeah, heard about that. What's it about?" I said, "Forget it. I I can't I, I can't tell you what it's about. It's about everything." <laughs> <laughs> it's about relationships it's about science fiction it's about love it's about regret it's about you know family relationships it's a, you know you name it it's about that you know and it really is uh it really is an amazing movie so you know watch it in 10 minute pieces um <clears throat> by the way thinking of you know movies and things uh i i mentioned to you a few times uh this series, The Singing Detective, right? Now, I've talked to a lot of people about that, and most people can't get through it. They can't get through the first episode. And I always tell people, hey, you know, watch the first couple episodes. You know, force yourself to do it. Once you get into it, you know, it's, uh, then, you know, once you get it, then it's like, oh, wow, this is fantastic, right? Well, it's a little bit like that with this every, everything, everywhere, all at once, you know. I mean, when I started to watch it, I don't think I got more than 10 minutes in and it was like, whoa, this is too weird for me, you know. But then I, like I said, I watched, you know, 
once I got about halfway into it, then I realized, oh, wow, this is really something unusual. And now that I've seen the whole thing, and, I, and I've only watched it once, I'm going to have to watch it again, but uh, I think, man, this is just an amazing work of art. You know, it's an amazing piece of work. So um, one more comment I was going to make before, um, before we end the call here is um, James Spooner, who I mentioned a couple weeks ago, uh, I met him through uh, another person who invited me on their podcast. And I said, why are you, you know, why are you interested in me? And she said, well, I have your book. So I said, well, where did you get my book? And how did you end up with my book? And she said, oh, my mentor gave it to me. He's been giving out your books to people, right? <laughs> so I said, who is this guy? Uh, it turns out it's James Spooner, right? Who used to be a trainer for the Napoleon Hill Foundation for something like 15 years. At any rate, I was talking to him the other day, and he said something which I thought was worth passing on, you know. He said, a lot of people have trouble with goals. So he said, I don't talk about goals. I talk about a promise, you know. So, for example, he, he might say, in regard to this trip to England that I'm taking, that's not a goal. It's a promise I'm making to myself. I promised myself to take myself on this trip. You know, so I thought that was an interesting reframe because uh, he said, if you make a promise to somebody, the chances are you're going to keep it. So make a promise to yourself. And he said, it just changes the flavor, you know, it changes the energy around the idea of a goal, right? Yeah, that reminds me of... Um... Another thing I heard that was kind of similar, I had, um, I had a gentleman I worked with in the past, and he talked, he said, he liked the word prefer versus expect. You know, and he said, uh, you know, a lot of times when you get angry, you'll find that there's a hard rule in your mind, you know, morally, or there's a line you don't cross and stuff like that. And it leads to a lot of pain. You know, sometimes you get angry and say things you shouldn't say or do things you shouldn't do or whatever, you can't take it back. But he said, if you just change that word to prefer, it soothes a lot of fights or you know, whatever you want to call. What but was the uh, what was the first word? I, I didn't catch it. Uh, well, it's versus, you know, you expect something to happen. It's like, you don't talk to me that way. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. So change, you know, change you expect to, to prefer. Like yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so, that's good. That's good. Yeah, language is, is important, as we've talked about many times, right? Uh, changing, changing one word sometimes can... Uh, can have a huge difference, you know, can make a big difference. Naomi's back. Phil, yeah, sorry about that. I, 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 yeah, I, I need to go soon. So um, Okay, well I think we're just about ready to wrap it up. I unless, just, uh, I just hope you have I just have hope you have luck uh, uh, keeping um, Arturo around. <laughs> yeah, well I'm gonna write to him today. Because his and, circumstance and could see. change and meanwhile you know he could needs to stay he can watch all of the the videos yeah, another exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah, and you know we okay. can all you know we all appreciate our turtle. Okay, thanks, See Phil. You next week. Thanks, See you next Phil. week. Thanks, Phil. Uh, take care. Naomi, did you want to say anything? Yeah. Well, I went to push the button so I could talk, and then I hung up. So sorry about that. I realized that. Yeah, up. you. It said you want to be admitted, and then I admitted you, and you disappeared. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, no, I like the the. I like all what you guys are talking about, and I also um, like the promise versus goal. I, I think that's uh, especially to oneself. Yeah, it, it's an it interesting, interesting yep. reframe, right? By the way, there's something yep. that happened this week. I was going to mention it to you guys, and I almost forgot about it. Thank goodness I wrote it down here on my little worksheet, you know, my little notes for the session. Um about a week ago, I got a message through Facebook, and it was from this person, and he said, um, I think I'm a cousin of yours. So, you know, my first thought was, what is this, some kind of a scam? You know, he's in jail, and he wants to borrow money, you know. Um, but it turns out, I've talked to this guy a couple times now, and he's a cousin of mine. He lives in a place called Maple Ridge, which is just outside 
Vancouver. Oh. Kathy knows where that is. And so he's from Ireland. And so he's introduced me, sort of virtually at least, to a whole bunch of other cousins that I have in Ireland right now. My wife and I are going to Ireland. You know, I was going to go to Ireland for a one or two days, right? Um, because I don't know anybody there. The only the, the only connection I have family-wise is my cousin uh, John, who's 80, right? And I talked to him on the phone, and he's, you know, he's happy for us to come over, but, you know, he's 80, so he's not probably going to, you know, and I don't want to impose on him too much, you know. Um, but, uh, this guy, um, whose name is Eamon, he's younger and he's got a bunch of siblings and he said, Hey, you know, they'd love to show you around. If you want to go to Dublin, you want to go to Belfast, you know, they'll, they'll be happy to take you and show you around because you're family. Right? <laughs> so I thought now, isn't that amazing? I mean, one of the, one of the sort of, um, metadata undercurrents of this trip is to strengthen my connections with my roots, right? With my family situation, you know. Uh, and so all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere comes this guy. Now I have a whole bunch of new cousins from a whole different branch on my family tree. So that to me is just amazing. I mean, it's like, Whoa, you know, talk about the law of attraction and talk about, you know, coincidence and whatever, you know, it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's added a whole new dimension to this trip to Ireland. So, yeah. So thanks for, for, for this today. It was great. Um, thanks for Kathy for all the input and Greg um, and Phil too. And um, Naomi, of course. Yeah. And so... Miss Jessica... Jessica. Jessica busy today? Must have been. Yes, she's out of town. She's uh, she's uh, she's in a great place called Harrison Hot Springs, which mm. is a beautiful lake mountain resort, um, maybe an hour or two outside of Vancouver. You know, uh, you can look at it. Go on Google and look at Harrison Hot Springs. Anyway, that's where she is. She's hanging out with a friend of hers from grade school. No oh, fun. <laughs> really how amazing is that you know okay thanks everybody have a great week have a good week have a great week talk bye. to you later thanks bye 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 for more information about this online community to get your own copy of the book upon which this entire training series is based either the ebook, the paperback, or the audiobook, go to mindtimeandpower.com where you can also get a free copy of this Design Your Life workbook.